Hello and welcome to this revamped YouTube tutorial. In today's video, I will talk to you about IAS 15, the default integrator in Rebound. We can express an ordinary differential equation in this form. y dot of t is equal to f of y and t as well. This is a standard form for an ordinary differential equation and we can express the n-body problem in this form. In that case, f would include the gravitational forces. The trick that IAS 15 uses is to rewrite this differential equation as an integral. For that, we simply integrate over both sides. And then the left-hand side becomes y of t. So we can express the solution y of t as an integral over f. We've converted a differential equation into an integral, and we now need to approximate this integral on the right-hand side. You probably already know several methods to approximate integrals on the computer. One of the simplest is the Riemann sum. It divides the interval over which we want to integrate a function into smaller intervals, and then approximates the area under the curve by small rectangles where the value is taken either on the left or on the right-hand side of that small interval. So we have one function evaluation per small interval. Now this is not a good approximation, but if we make the interval small enough, it gets better and better. If we think of this Riemann sum in terms of solving an ordinary differential equation, then the Riemann sum is equivalent to the Euler method. Now you probably also know that there are other methods for approximating integrals that are better than the left-handed Riemann sum. In general, these higher order methods have more function evaluations throughout the integral. The more function evaluations there are, the higher order on approximation of the function y of t and therefore of the integral you can make. Now the highest order that you can get for your integration scheme for the fewest functional evaluations are called Gauss quadratures. There's one special consideration in our case where we want to use this integral representation of an ordinary differential equation. We have the left-hand side given already at the, at the beginning of the interval because that's just our initial condition for the differential equation. The special subclass of Gauss quadratures that take that into account are called Gauss Rada quadratures. They have the left hand point fixed and only vary the other points. For such a Gauss Rada quadrature, we can have a scheme that has m function evaluations and gives us a 2m plus 1 order scheme for the integral ODE expression that we're solving in the end. Now there's one problem though with using this integral representation to solve a differential equation. If we just solve an integral, we know what the function y of t is, but here we don't. We want to find what y of t is. So how can we evaluate y of t throughout the interval if we don't know its value? This is done using a predictor corrector loop. IES 15 first makes a prediction of what y of t might look like throughout the interval. It's then using this to calculate the integral using this high order gauss rada quadrature and then it's iterating this loop until it is converged. This prediction can be based on previous time steps. This effectively makes IS15 a multi-step method. However, if there are no previous time steps, for example if you just start an integration, this predictor correct the loop will still converge. It might just take a few more iterations. So technically it is a multi-step method, but in practice you can get away without it. It just makes the code a little slower. IS15 also tries to predict the length of the next time step. This is important because if the time step is too long, you might need many predictor corrector loops to converge. IS15 tries to keep the number of predictor corrector loops that it needs to an absolute minimum. This is essential to making it a fast scheme. 
Specifically, IS-15 was designed to reach machine precision from the very beginning. Machine precision is about 10 to the minus 16 in relative terms. This is the limit that you can reach with double floating point precision on any normal computing hardware. To do this, we found through experimentation that seven function evaluations, which results in a 15th order scheme, gives us the best ratio of speed versus accuracy. And IS-15 is called IS-15 because it's a 15th order scheme. Typically, we need about two to three predictor corrector loops for most numerical integrations. So that's a small number. And again, it's critical to keep these predictor, predictor corrector loops to a small number. In fact, you might have seen a warning message at some point. If your predictor corrector loops do not converge, um, rebound will, will notify you. That can happen if um, there's a particularly close encounter or something else is going on in your simulation that um, makes IS-15 choose a slightly non-optimal time step. If that is the case, doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem, but you might want to look into it um, just to make sure. So with two to three predictor corrector loops, we need about 25 function evaluations for one complete time step with IS-15. Because they're 25, it is going to be slower per time step than some other schemes. For example, Leapfrog or Wisdom Holman need one function evaluation per time step. So IS-15 will be at least 25 times slower than Leapfrog for the same time step. However, IS-15 is going to be much more accurate using, um, using the same time step. So if you wanted to have the same accuracy with a Leapfrog integrator, you would need to reduce the time step significantly. And in the end, you would find that IS-15 is more accurate for the same accurate. It is faster for the same accuracy. Let's talk a bit more about what it means to have a 15th order scheme, because a 15th order scheme is potentially somewhat unusual from what you're used to. If you're used to a low order scheme, Leapfrog or Wisdom Holman, then there are some specific issues to consider here. What I'm showing you in this illustration is the error, and it can be any error metric that you choose, for example, the relative energy error, as a function of the time step on the x-axis. The smaller you make the time step, the smaller the error becomes. Because it's a 15th order scheme, if you make this plot on a log, log scale, you get a line with a very steep slope. The key thing to note here is that there are limits to your errors. On the right hand side, you can reach an order unity error. This means you're getting the simulation completely wrong. It's no longer physical. For example, you might have a planet on a circular orbit, and then the planet gets ejected from the orbit. That's an order unity error. On the left hand side, you reach machine precision. If you're in that regime, then reducing your time step any further does not give you a more accurate solution because you've already solved it to the point where the computer cannot represent numbers more accurately anymore. So these two limits really limit what you can do with IS-15. And because it's such a steep slope in between, it's a 15th order slope, um, the amount of change you need in the time step to get a large change in the error is very small. A factor of 10 in the time steps will get you from machine precision to an almost order unity error. That's because 10 to the power of 15 is approximately 10 to the 16. So a small change in time steps will lead to a large error. Imagine you're at the machine precision limit currently, and you want to speed up your simulation by having a larger time step. Let's say you want to increase your time step by a factor of 10. You make your code 10 times faster. Then, with IS-15, you're very likely not going to succeed because you end up with an extremely large error, potentially an order unity error, and your simulation will just be wrong. So changing the time step in IS-15 manually is in general not a good idea. It, the automatic adaptive time step tries to find a good time step that is somewhere on the left hand side of this plot. And if you manually intervene, you're most likely to push it all the way to the right and not get physical results anymore. 
So let's talk about a few tips when working with IS15. IS15 is the default integrator in Rebound because it works in most cases. It works out of the box without you having to choose a time step or any accuracy settings. It will, in most cases, just work fine. However, it might not be very fast and it's definitely not the best choice for every problem out there. I encourage you to listen to a previous video where I've gone into more detail about how to choose an integrator for a specific problem. So try out if another integrator works better for you. One thing to keep in mind is that changing the precision control parameter in Rebound, which is called Epsilon for IS15, is in general not a good idea for the reason I showed you on the previous slide. If you try to make your simulation 10 times faster, you will not succeed with IS15. You need to choose a different integrator. There's one other way which you might be able to get around certain issues, namely by setting the minimum time step, min dt. If you do this, the automatic adaptive time stepping will be limited to time steps larger than this min dt. In many cases, that might not give you physical results, but in rare cases where you're not very interested in a close encounter, but IS15 would reduce the time step a lot trying to resolve this close encounter, you might get away with, an, with a simulation that gets otherwise stuck and just reduce the time step way too much. One other issue with IS15 that you might encounter is if the planets have close encounters between them and they're not close to the origin, then the algorithm tries to resolve this encounter as accurately as it should, namely machine precision, but it might not succeed because the encounter is not happening at the origin and relative differences between planets cannot be resolved to 10 to the minus 16 anymore. In that case, IS15 might stall, and again, this MINDT parameter might help you with it. The last topic I'd like to discuss are long-term integrations. We initially designed IS15 specifically with the idea that we want to run long-term integrations with it. What you see in this plot is a relative energy error as a function of time in units of orbits. IS15 is the lower green curve. IS15 starts with a very small relative error around 10 to the minus 16, and then the error slowly grows. The emphasis here is on slowly. It grows sublinearly. That's because IS15 has random round of errors. They are randomly above or below the true value where they should be. This is kind of the best case scenario for working with the floating point precision numbers. The resulting error will be a random walk, and that's what you see in this plot. The slope of the line on the bottom is the square root of t, the slope is one half, so that errors do not add up uh, as fast as with some other methods. That gives you very good long-term um, properties. However, IS15 might not be the best method still for long-term integrations. If you don't need this high accuracy, you might get away with a wisdom Hohmann integrator that has a much larger time step and therefore also a much larger, uh, a much better uh, performance in terms of speed. IS15 is only competitive for long-term integrations if you want very high accuracy. Otherwise, choose a different integrator. I hope you found that video useful. If you like more information about IS15, check out the paper Reiner Spiegel 2015, as well as the rebound documentation listed here. And if none of those resources answer your questions, go ahead and post an issue on the GitHub repository. Either myself or someone else will be happy to answer your questions about IS15 or any other issues you might have with Rebound. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you in a future video.